If I ask you to name all the things that you love, how long would it take for you to name yourself? I think that was self-explanatory, right? We love our cars. We love our watches and our houses and our shoes. But really, how often do you say you love yourself? How often do you look in the mirror and say, I love you? So the, the exercise that, that I call out with that piece as a prompt is to write yourself a love letter. That's it. There's no further instructions. Make it as long as you want. Grammar doesn't matter. You know, you can write, I love you, I love you, I love you a hundred times. Or you can get really deep and say, you know what, I love you and I love your hair and I love the way you work out and I love the way you chew food and I love the way you sleep. Like whatever, whatever comes to mind. And, you know, my, throughout this show, I'm going to ask you many times to write yourself love letters and take it seriously. Valentine's Day is a beautiful day to write yourself a love letter. Take yourself out on a date. I mean, don't ignore your significant other, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whatever. But you're still you and you still have a relationship with yourself. It's the longest relationship you'll ever have. So take a moment, write yourself a love letter, send it to me, and I'll read it on the show. Hi guys, Natasha Pesez here. I am a singer-songwriter, TV personality, and I am so excited to be with Ruben Rojas tonight on Live Through Love. We are talking all about what drives us as artists, creative, and how we can help you guys tap into that in order to live your life through love, always. Um, you're my studio. You can see that there's a very common word that I use in a lot of things here. And the purpose behind it is, I like to say that we either operate at a love or we operate at a fear. Yeah. What does that statement make you feel? I mean, you just feel so much love already coming into the studio because you really see that it's something that is a part of who you are. And I think when you do something that is just innate, it's because it's out of love, you know, and I'm honored to be here with you today. So thank you so much for having me. The studio is awesome. It's I love seeing like the behind the scenes of when artists get creative and what kind of goes on in their head and how they start doing things. Because I think as artists, you always see the final product, but mm -hmm. you don't get to really experience what goes through that artist's mind and soul and body and spirit in order to create that. So you're completely right when it comes to you either operate out of fear or out of love. And I don't think hate is really an existence. I don't think it's something that is innate in us. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that uh, is based purely on fear. It's all about things we don't know about and that we are scared to find out about. And when we're not in tune with ourselves or when we um, haven't, you know, been exposed to something is when hatred or fear comes from. Um, so I think finding and working from a place of love in our own lives and all angles, you know, when it comes to professionally, personally, romantically, in all these ways, mm -hmm. um, your life just changes. Like you become more connected to who you are, you know, and I think that's hard to do mm -hmm. for some people <laughs> and it takes years. And that's why we're all on this earth. Cause that's the whole point, I think, to connect with all of it. All of it. Live through love is yeah. my tagline. You know how Nike says, just do it. Yeah. I say live through love. I love it. What does that make you feel? How would you define that? And as a singer, as a performer, you know, what would a tune or a music be that, that makes you feel live through love? I mean, live through love is basically my life mantra and my life motto. There, there is nothing that I have chosen to do in my life that is not out of a decision uh, based off of love. You know, I've always loved to sing and singing for me made me happy. Mm. It was something that I don't, I can't describe the feeling that I get when I'm allowed to just 
sing and no one's hearing me. I don't have neighbors. I don't have people complaining. And like, I have two younger brothers and I lived in New York city in an apartment with my parents my whole life until I moved to Los Angeles. And then of course, was since we all moved out and stuff before that, but it was hard to kind of just do what you want to do at home. Cause you got everyone be like, shut up. I'm watching a movie. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. So it stops you from kind of being what you want to do. And the fact that you still want to do it anyway and be like, I'm, this makes me happy. I'm doing it because of I'm, I love it so much. Um, it is, is a really special thing because some people don't know what they, what they love and you have to try yeah. everything. And, you know, we got lucky. And I think in that sense where we knew our calling maybe early on in life to the point where we're like, this feels good. I'm just going to do it. But it doesn't mean we're like, only that only makes us happy. I think mm -hmm. love is an, is like a broad spectrum of things, you know, like I love food. <laughs> it brings me genuine happiness. I'm not going to just eat something because, um, yeah, it's good for me, but there are also a lot of things that are good for me that I will love to eat, you know, and it's about picking and choosing things. Like mm -hmm. I'm a big romantic. So for me, finding that romance in, in a relationship, uh, is, is why I want to do it. Like some people are like, Oh, they're nice. It's convenient. They're everything's easy. They don't yeah. complain. Life's too short I'm like, that. that's good. I'm happy that there's no drama. Like that's, I'm happy that you don't want drama, but I need passion. I need excitement. I need romance. I need you know, I'm also a Sagittarius. I don't know if that counts. Like I'm a fire sign. And if I don't have that passion in my life for everything I do, it's not worth doing for me. And that includes work. That includes the friends that I have. That includes, um, the lovers, you know, that I, that I find, uh, it's more so life is short, like you said. And who, who is going to tell us what we can and cannot do in this life? Like society already is a pain in the ass by telling us, well, you got to do this. You got to get that and see this. And you got your family who's telling you, you got to do this. You got to do that. And you got to do it the way we did it and the way that our parents did it. And you need mm -hmm. to have, you know, fit kids or get a house or get a job or whatever it is they want you to do. But you're like, for me, I'm always thinking like, who's to tell me that I can't just go to some island, live in a hut and just live my life however I want to live it. Like you have your, you're the master of your own life. And I think hearing these distractions from people being like, you should, you should, you should, you should is so hard on people. Cause you you trust these people. You love these people. You want to make them proud. You want to make them happy. You want the love from them because of mm -hmm. what you're doing, all these things. But at the end of the day, if you're not doing it for love, through love, with love, you're going to end up being miserable. You're marrying the person your parents want you to marry. You're going to end up being miserable. If you're doing the job because your parents want you mm -hmm. to do the job, you're not going to love your job. You're going to be miserable. You're not going to do it well. Mm -hmm. It's just inevitable. There is a never a time where you'll be like, I've grown into it. No, it's inevitable. It's just a ticking time bomb. So if you don't start it out with that, I think you know, there's a chance that you're going to have to reevaluate. So living your life through love for me means being authentically listening to yourself, taking the time to get to know yourself, doing things where you're like, that is not what I want to do, or that really feels good. And I didn't expect to really like that. Mm -hmm. It's experimenting with yourself and not allowing other people to manipulate or in interfere with that, um, inner choice. I love that. <laughs> so the takeaway. Sorry, it was it long. Simple. No, it's great. <laughs> so it's self-love. Yeah. It's your life. Yeah. Yes, take advice. Yes, listen to your surroundings. That's part of your life and experience. Sure. But only you can keep yourself from doing everything. And that's it. And you're making the choice to allow someone to keep you from that. Yeah. You're also allowing someone to offend you because that's giving your power away. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of these things, it's coming back to realizing, do I love myself enough to protect myself in a way that I can live my life wholly, fully and authentically? Mm -hmm. And that's it. And everyone else is just part of that experience. Yeah. And it's a, not an easy thing to do. Like you say, oh, no. like, oh, we'll just do it. Like personally for me, um, I grew up, uh, like I said, in New York City. My father's French. My mother's from Chile. So I was really raised in a very European uh, household with very much like Latin values. So we're, we were very 
a, a close family and we always had our friends over and it was always a full house and it was always big dinners. And, you know, it was always like, what do you need? Let me help you. Let me do this for you. Da, da, da. And so my father, um, was never really someone who was like, I'm, really excited for you for this music project. You know, he's like, all right, well, how are you making money and how Practical. are you going to sustain it? And are other people in your industry doing better than you? And can you do as good as them? And if you can't, then you should probably quit. There's only 1% of artists that really make it in order to support themselves the way they want to. And I don't know if that's going to be for you. And, and I haven't stopped hearing that, you know, like I've been on major worldwide stages. I've been on national and international television. I have released songs all over the world. I've had collaborations with so many different artists and DJs, and he's still telling me that to this day. So I always had these doubts being like, I should give up. I should not do this anymore. I should like, am I going to be as good as these artists that I look up to? I don't know, you know, and it really, it really had an impact on me. I don't think he realizes that, but for me, it was causing so much self-doubt mm -hmm. and so much self-loathing of not being able to get to where I wanted to be in a certain amount of time. He's like, well, Tasha, give yourself two, three years. If you don't do it in then, then you failed and you need to move on. It's like, well, who says that I failed if I'm still working towards it? And if that's something that I'd love to do. And for me to just cut off someone as important as my father's opinion is like really hard and really not something that everyone mm -hmm. should do or wants to do. But someone like I'm saying as close to you as that to really be like, I'm still going to do it. I'm mm -hmm. still going to do it. I'm still going to do it. And it's my life, you know, it's, and I keep having to remind myself that sometimes I'm like, yes, I want to make him proud. And yes, I know he wants the best for me, but it, I know what's best for me in a, mm -hmm. in that, in that the end of the day. And if that means I'm going to bust my ass for eight hours in the studio, writing a song that mm -hmm. maybe no one will ever hear. Um, that's a day for me well spent. Cause I got to do something that is meaningful to me that I love to do, yeah. you know? Cause like you said, you can have all the shoes and the house and the, this, and because you find a job that pays really well and you live in a beautiful place doing a job you hate, are you fulfilled? Mm -hmm. Like, are you really living your best life? Are you sitting there? Like, I love my life. This is great. I have all these beautiful things. Or are you like, fuck, I just wrote a song and I feel great. And I feel like I've allowed myself to express myself and people are going to listen to this, whoever it may be, whether it be one person or a million people, it's going to touch them in some way. And I think if you live your life that doesn't self-love is I'm going on a rant right now. Self-love is sometimes people think of it as selfish. Like, oh, I'm going to do something that benefits me. I think it's, it's not that like, it's a way of being so okay with you that you're able to give, you know, mm -hmm. like I don't make music for me to listen to at home. Like I don't, I don't like listening to my own voice. <laughs> like I make music to touch someone else for them to go through whatever they're going through and experience that in a way they didn't know how and releasing whatever they needed to release emotionally. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the purpose of maybe your art. Like what, you know, why do you paint? Is it because it releases something in yourself or is it because when someone sees it, they have an emotion and they're like, shit, that feels good to me in some way that I can't explain. Both letting it out. And then someone's going to take that in. Yeah. So it's giving and receiving. Yeah. And I think that's what love is about in all aspects. And if you don't have that, I just don't see the point in really living, you know? I agree. That's the, that's the journey for me. It's finding those things and, and sticking to it with like your whole heart, no matter what other people really say. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. Yeah. I always say it's, it's about practice. This is not easy. I'm not talking about rom-coms and Hallmark channel movies and <laughs> valentine's movie. day yeah that's not what we're talking about we're talking about something or someone did something to me and we can easily operate out of fear and be i'm a victim i'm unworthy i don't deserve this i'm always a failure or you can say hey what can i do here to shift this perspective let me look at it through love and say i am worthy of this mm -hmm. and let me take a proactive stance instead of reacting to something mm -hmm. and and that's healthier but it is harder. It's so much easier to commiserate with friends, family, turn on the TV. Yeah, the world sucks. But a hundred percent. And I think it takes a certain level of self-love in order to get to that point of being able to walk away from things that mm -hmm. don't align with your self-worth. But finding self-worth is also a journey. And I think the things that you experience, the people you meet in life, um, 
sort of are able to dictate how you treat yourself, you know? And I think the universe puts, I'm very much a believer of the universe. I'm very spiritual in that sense that I do believe there's a higher power and something mm -hmm. that is unexplainable that drives us in certain ways. But I have personally experienced certain things in my life where there are moments of doubt when you're like, am I worth this? Um, and this person is making me feel this. Mm -hmm. Is that because it's the truth? Or is that because I am not serving myself the way that I should be? And how can I find the love to love myself enough to walk away from mm -hmm. something that's so detrimental to me? And as you get older, you start really putting your foot down by being like, I am not dealing with any of this right now. But as you're learning it, I think it's all about I mean, I can't say it's age related because those moments come in time differently for everyone. I got to experience it in a younger time um, where I think now in my mid thirties, I'm able to really say like, this is unacceptable to me because I know that I will not allow someone to come between me and myself, you know, um, well, we can get deeper into that, but that's, I completely agree with you in that sense. No. Yeah. You know, what you're talking about is really establishing boundaries. And when we're younger, we don't have boundaries because we're superheroes. We're invincible. That yeah. doesn't happen to me. Yeah. We're just young and gunning for life. And Everything's gusting. in your favor. I think when you're young and you think that the world is just your oyster, which it kind of is. And I love the mentality of that, that I used to have in a sense, because everything always went my way. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was young, um, I saw a pageant on television. I saw Miss Teen USA and I was sitting in my living room with my parents and I was like, I could do that. Like, what do they have that I don't have? I'm going to sign up. Mm -hmm. And I signed up and there was 250 girls and I came in top five. And I'd never done a thing like that in my whole life. I was like 16, 17 years old. And my mom and I were doing it together. I was like, what dress should I wear? And I was like, let's do something fun. Let's do like a leopard dress. <laughs> like yeah. so random, not pageant style just wild just wild i was like you know let's get crazy and um i came in top five and afterwards i was like oh, okay now i know how this works i'm winning next year i'm winning there's no one that's gonna tell me i'm not winning next year so i came and of course you know the competition is big all these girls are trained their whole lives for it they're they have pageant coaches and swimsuit walking coaches and interview question coaches and that's just my mom and i we did some flashcards. i was like ask me a question hit me <laughs> she's like how do you feel about this president. And I'm like, all right, this is how I feel. So it's just by kind of doing things on the spot that mm -hmm. I was like, there's no way I'm losing. There's no way. Like in my mind, there was beautiful girls that year who had extensive, you know, training and much more experience than I had. But I think it's all in your head. And I was like, I'm winning. And, and I won. <laughs> and That's there amazing. Were, yeah. And there was really nothing that I was like, you know, I, it was all about visualization for me in that sense, where I couldn't let the intimidation get to me because I was like, you might be more beautiful than me. You might have more experience than me, but I'm still winning. You know, like there's, I visualized the girl crowning me. I visualized them. So that sort of at a younger age, I was, I was 18 years old. And at that point I was like, there's nothing that I can't do if I just think it, mm -hmm. if I'm just like, I want to do this, I can. And so that sort of paved the way for my career and the choices that I made. And it was the same for love. It was like, if I want this person and I want us to have this beautiful love affair, it's going to happen. I'm going to do it. It's going to mm -hmm. be a thing. And, and those were the biggest decisions that I made in my life because they were all based on my heart. All of my decisions have always based from love. And I really had no like repercussions to things. Like I think you always think things are going to work out in your favor. So I definitely took a lot of risks and jumped off the cliffs and prayed I flew type of energy. <laughs> so I could relate to that a lot. Jumping yeah. off cliffs, figuring it out, being fiercely optimistic. Yeah. But there's something that I'm that, that I'm really hearing you say, and there's a lot of conversation around ego and arrogance and confidence. Being confident doesn't mean you're arrogant. And being confident isn't a bad thing when it comes to ego. Ego is good. Ego isn't about being soup. It's a buzzword. It's a bad buzzword. People yeah. think ego is bad, but no, it comes from a good place. It's meant to protect us. Well, that's the thing. I think ego is really meant as like a barrier to protect us. And a lot of the time it's our mind that we need to protect us over like our initial emotion mm -hmm. to do something. Um, but ego also is our biggest 
flaw, I think, as people, as human beings. Like ego really allows us to hide behind fear and allowing us to continuously accept things that we should not. <laughs> it's a weird way to explain it, but ego has caused so many relationships to dissolve, mm -hmm. um, in all aspects of people's lives, you know, not just romantic ones, but I think removing the ego is such a hard and strenuous work that someone needs to do over many, many years of their life, um, in order for them to be more connected to what their true wants and purpose are. Mm -hmm. Um, because you'll say you want something, but if someone says, you know, you can't have it. You want it more just because your ego is forcing you. But is it really what you want? Mm -hmm. Is it really what's going to serve you? Is it really something that you think is best for you? Or is it just because your ego is telling you certain things or not apologizing because your ego won't allow it mm -hmm. or you know, jealousy, because your ego is thinking like, mm -hmm. all of these things are guarded and, and fronted by the ego, which is, like you said, it, it's like a double edged sword in that sense. But I do think confidence and humility are two completely different things. Like you yeah. can be humble and have confidence because it's something that's from within. I think confidence genuinely is knowing that I don't care what you think. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you say. I'm good with me. And that for me is confidence. I think like arrogance is like needing that from everyone being like, oh yes, they said that I'm this and they said that I'm that. And, and being affected by it mm -hmm. if they don't say it, you know? But what you see is a lot of confusion in people and saying, I'm this, I'm that. No, you're actually here or there. But it also could leave when you said, does it serve me? Do I want this? Or now you're lusting after it. Like I've been in relationships that I thought were love. No, it was lust. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference. Mm -hmm. I wanted it. It's looked good walking down the aisles, whatever the case mm -hmm. is. But it was purely lust. wasn't a healthy relationship. You can have that with a lot of things. I want those shoes. They're going to make me broke. You get them and you're like expectation hangover like mm -hmm. i don't really want that i don't really need that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but when it comes from self-love and that purpose and that's really what drives all of this is it's coming here people ask me all the time like okay you paint about love and you do this and you do that and like you don't give me love or like i'm not actually giving anyone love i'm yeah. giving myself love i'm having these conversations with myself we're mirrors of each other and someone else needs to receive that message interpret it their way. Mm -hmm. Well, what I'm really giving you is showing you how self-love can propel you forward. Yeah. I think the only thing that we can do is give us, is give ourselves self-love because then, you know, it's sort of like we have to fill our cup in order for it to run us over to give to others. Mm -hmm. If we're, if our cups are empty within ourselves in our own space alone at home, and we're just miserable because we're lonely or unfulfilled, no one else is going to fill that. There's not a person, a thing, a place, an mm -hmm. item, a pair of shoes, a, a drink out like that's going to fulfill that. Mm -hmm. So I think once you spend that time doing that, what really fulfills you with for you is art and painting and all those things, then you're able to give that love to other people. So if they're feeling like they're not getting enough from you, it's because you're busy like on yourself right now mm -hmm. and you won't be able to give them authentically what they need or want or mm -hmm. what they're looking for. So that's something I think that we, as like a society, try to um, fake in a way, you know, where it's like, oh, I'm showing so much love for everybody else. Like, look how much of a good person I am. And I feel so good about myself because of that. Meanwhile, you go home and you're miserable and you're not fulfilling all the things that people think you're fulfilling. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like fake. Like, I'd rather be like, hey, I'd love to do this and that with you, but I'm not feeling my best right now and I got to take care of me and I got to focus on what that means for me. And I think being in the music business for so long, um, it's a bitch of a business and you're kind of going up and down in so many ways, especially over these past two years, it's been like the absolute worst yeah. for musicians on all levels. So it's, it's like, you know, you want to finally do things for your friends, but you're like, I'm in a place where I need to focus on my happiness and me right now. Cause otherwise I'm just going to be a shitty friend, you know? And that's not what we want. We want to be mm -hmm. good, good friends. <laughs> it, friends are so funny. Cause I always say like ex friends, past friends. Yeah. I'm like we can go in a room, drink and start hitting off just like we used to, uh -huh. but it's like, you're here. I'm going here and I'm not even where I want to go. Yeah. Does that mean you're leaving anyone behind, whether it's a friend, past relationship, even family, whatever the case is, if you have a goal and you want to get to it, 
And you know that this is going to fulfill you, take you to another place, find more self-love and move you forward. Why are we feeling guilt sometimes or being guilted in? You're leaving me behind. Why aren't you calling? Why don't we hang out like we used to? And it's because you've now worked on yourself to get here. These people haven't moved there yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like, well, come join me. You could come with me, when I, but I'm not going to go back that way. I can't yeah. go backwards. Yeah. I think that a lot of guilt is put into those moments. You know, like you love your friends. And I think people that have empathy, like most artistic people, I think, are very sensitive, overly I hate the word overly sensitive because that's bullshit. Like when people like you're always like, fuck that. Like I'm a human. Okay. I'm sensitive. Um, but I'm you it want overly sensitive yeah, all the time. it's bullshit. <laughs> it's overly sensitive is a bullshit. And as term. a guy, you know, I'm not a small guy. I'm like, they're like, why are you so sensitive? Why do you get butthurt? I, like, I can't just... stand that. It's like men and women have equal emotions. It's not a gender thing. It's like we are either sensitive or you're a, a freaking sociopath. Mm -hmm. Like it's like that is it. Like there's no such thing as overly emotional, overly sensitive, overly I'm a human and I'm mm -hmm. happy to actually have emotions. Thank yeah. you. But to get back to the friends, it's like I, I have like it's a bit of a – of a tough move when you want to keep these people that you love around you, but you're like, does it serve me? You know, and you have to be a little bit harsh as your life progresses because then you won't progress, you know, and to have those boundaries of like, I'm going to go do this. And if you want to join me on that, it allows them to level up to mm -hmm. that. It gives them the opportunity to say, I love you and I want you to be in my life, but I can only have you in my life if you're joining me yeah. in the direction that I'm going in. And you'll see a lot of the people that are really meant to stay in your life will do that. Mm -hmm. Like I've had friends that I've had for years and like I see their successes and I'm like, fuck, this is awesome. Like I'm going here, you're going here. And the trajectory is sort of like, maybe I'm not doing as good as you, but then I'm doing a little bit better and then they're doing a little bit better. And it really feels like you you excite each other, you celebrate each other, you push each other to really be like, shit, my friend's doing really freaking good right now. He's booking like five shows. He just got a huge commercial. I was like, I need to start leveling up too. Mm -hmm. And so it gives you motivation. It doesn't make you feel like, oh, why aren't you hanging out with me? And then you're so famous and busy. It's like, no, then you're not vibrating at that level and yeah. you will not get to that point where you need to be to match them. Mm -hmm. So and then it's the same in the opposite way. You know, when I was doing really well, they're like, fuck, you're doing great. I'm so happy for you. I really need to do this. And, and that's how you level with friends. That's how you grow with the right mm -hmm. people. And the ones that can't, they're on their journey. You All you can do is be like, I love you. I care about your success. And I hope it, nothing mm -hmm. but that for you. You know, outside of that, you got to do what's best for you. Because I will firm believe, I'm doing like a closet clean out right now. And it's so hard to let go of some things that you just oh, love because yeah. they're like emotionally attached and you're like, I gotta let it go. Sentimental. There's a memory. Yeah. All these mm -hmm. things. And, and you're just like, it's gorgeous. And I spent so much money on it and blah, blah, blah. And then you're like, I have to let it go because if I don't, I can't let room in for new things, mm -hmm. new, exciting things, bigger, better things, things that serve me more like this, that served me 10 years ago and I loved it and I used it, but does it serve me today? You know, I'm from New York. So in New York, the fashion, the style, what we do, what we wear, how we use things is so different Don't from California. So I'm like, I can't use any of my things that I love here because I'll look crazy and feel crazy, you know? Um, so I had to let go of so many things in certain ways. And I still am like, I'm going to keep this. It's so New York. I'm going to keep it because I'm a New Yorker and that's the way it's going to be. I don't give a shit about what this fashion is here. Like, that's me. But it's the same, I think, with people, with, with any kind of – I hate to – compare like people and items because it's completely different things. But uh, in the sense of like, if it's not working for you, let it go and be happy that it was there in order to receive the new mm -hmm. things that are going to be best for your time now. You some, know? some of the hard things are we've been friends for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And a lot of it served you to X, but like, okay, you're here good. And I have to keep going here. That shouldn't be one of the anchor points or whatever memories were together or this or that and that's usually what keep loyalty like i'm a super overly loyal person so it's like oh it's like hurts but like no it's not I'm, i can't keep getting pulled back 
I think that's totally, I mean, I read something similar to that the other day where it's like, you can have a relationship with someone for 10 years, but then meet someone new and be with them for a week and have a much deeper connection with that person. I don't think time has anything to do with it. You can be in a romantic relationship for 10 years, married or whatever, and then meet someone and be with them for six months and be like, I've never felt more understood. I've never felt more connected to someone. Time is a way for us to give excuses to like, oh, you've been so loyal, been so many years. It's like, sure, but I'm a different person 10 years later that it's evolved into growing. Because if we're not growing, what are we doing? Like what, there needs to be an evolution of who we are as people, mm-hmm. what we're learning, what we're doing, how we're making decisions. And we should all be doing that, you know? And if there are people in your life that are not doing that with you, like I said, you need to reevaluate. But I'm also an incredibly loyal person. So I'm always like, oh yeah, my friends from back in the day. But I don't believe in time defining a relationship. Like it needs to be the right person for you. Like we as humans are constantly changing. Like our cells, we have brand new cells every what, seven to nine years. Mm -hmm. We're different people every seven to nine years. And I would not have made the same decisions that I probably did when I was 20 than I do now that I'm in my thirties because we've experienced different things in our bodies. And, you know, you look back and you're like, oh God, I can't believe I did that. But at the time you're like, that was convinced I was doing it. And I felt good about it. Now, of course, we're like, okay, that was a part of my journey then. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with experiences with people. Like we're, we want different things from different people. I don't think I'd still be friends with people that I was hanging out with back in the day because I was a different person. And now, you know, In my heart, I'm the same person, you know, but the things that I want for myself and, and what I've learned along the way force you to bring in that kind of energy for Mm -hmm. those kind of people. And it's exciting. And there's also another thing to throw into that, right? 10 years ago, we were 10 years younger, 10 years from now, we're 10 years older. Mm -hmm. We know we're that much closer to the ends of our lives. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't get to live forever. Yeah. Hopefully 125. That's what (laughs) I'm going for. But uh, I see it for you. (laughs) But I know that as we get older, my my I check my mortality all the time. Yeah. I had no problem, you know, snowboarding and doing flips and this and that. Now I'm like, I'm not gonna do that. I don't want to risk something that takes me away from this on another path where I'm going forward. Yeah. Yeah, because a lot of time time. as you get older, you think about family, you think about people you love, and you're like, I want to be able to be there for them in ways that I maybe couldn't earlier in my life or didn't realize that I should have been, Um, you know, and as we get older, we really (laughs) try to make the most rational decisions, you know, like I used to horseback ride, and I was um, an equestrian for 15 years, and I was a hunter jumper. So for me, I was always going over jumps on these mm-hmm. ginormous animals that for me, I was like, yeah, this is fun. This is great. And at the amount of times I've fallen, like tons of times I fell, And then I got back on the horse and mm-hmm. I did another jump and I fell again. And I'd have horses stop short in front of this jump and I go flying over it. Mm. Just thinking about that today, I'm like, I don't think I could do it. Yeah. I don't think I could do it. Just the thought of putting myself in that position. I'm like, oh shit, this is a big fucking horse. Like they could just step on me and I'd be dead. Like all the things that you think about. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's fear or I don't know if that's logic. That well, there's good, there's good parts of fear. I mean, fear is still healthy in a certain aspect. It's just the way the media portrays it, I think. They use it against us. But in that case, again, we, we know it's our mortality. We know we're getting closer to the ends of our lives. We know that because of that, we have less time to achieve all these goals. Mm. And if this is something I'm not taking further than what I am right now, you start thinking about all those other things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They just become more real. Yeah. It does help you probably convince you not to do it any further, but that's a it, good, good part of fear. It's hard because it's like, it's a love, you know, like for skiing for you, it's probably like a love and you just feel free and happy doing it. But then you're overthinking, like, am I going to get hurt? Am I going to break this? You, you hear some people have yeah, accidents. That actor and just died. You just died yeah. hitting a tree. Like, you know, like what's his name? Uh, Christopher Reeve, when he fell off the horse mm-hmm. and got paralyzed, I was traumatized by that. I was like, Oh my God, I do this all the time. Mm-hmm. So it's a, you have these stories, but we also get broken hearts every day. We're going to stop loving someone because our heart gets broken. Some like people do, unfortunately, I don't believe it. I think that it's just, uh, you know, again, fear of just being like, okay, you, you want to get hurt again, right? The whole experience of the human emotions you know, my wife and I watch This Is Us, and if, if Randall starts crying, I'm done. I'm just, <laughs> we look at each other, we're like, I'm not crying, you're crying, she's crying, where's the tissue? It's just like, we're cry- it gets us, like, that gets me all the time, and that's the stuff that I love to go through, but sometimes, like, no, you're a man, you shouldn't be crying. And I even catch myself, like, holding it all in my throat, and I feel pain here. Yeah. 
but it's just working through all that, experiencing all that. It's so it's so sad to me that society has put in such a space where men can't express themselves emotionally. Like you got to be a fucking dude, and you got to just keep it together. And you know, it's like why? You got to provide. You got to be a wall. There's a lot of. Pressures. I don't understand why yeah. that's like mutual. Like, why does providing and being a protector and for your woman all include not being emotional? Like, no. I don't understand why that's a, like, those are different things. <laughs> that's a great question. You know, because I think, yeah, I think it's important for a woman to feel like a woman and a man to feel like a man. A woman needs certain, diff- you know, things and a man needs different things in mm-hmm. a relationship. And, um, I was actually reading this book from this, oh, I forgot her name, older, um, love coach, you know, and she was really talking about the fundamentals of men and women and, um, and what we both need from each other. As opposed to just, um, you know, what society thinks we need. Like women, they think we need flowers and men, they think they just need sex. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I think it's, it's more so of what innately as humans, we both need from each other. And for women, you know, we want to feel adored and we want to feel cherished. Um, And men want to feel respected and they want to feel appreciated, you know, and it's such a different dynamic in how we give those things to each other. Mm -hmm. But ultimately that's what men and women want in such a different way. You know, some women feel adored by gifts. Some women feel adored by, you know, um, physical affection. You know, there's so many different ways, um, or by words, you know, of romance and Mm -hmm. poetry and songs and art and all those things. Uh, and men, you know, need to feel like, I'm protecting my woman. She appreciates and respects the fact that I'm protecting my woman. She acknowledges and honors my decisions in the household, like all those things to make them feel like that. Mm-hmm. But doesn't it's not void of emotion. It's not void of empathy. It's not void of, of connection, of love, of romance, of all those things that men are supposed to not have to feel to be sexy, right. you know? So like, how do we change that? How is that something that, is it women that need to be like, I want you to cry or women it's a little bit of both. It's, to be it's like, a little bit of cry. both. Yeah. Um, and we can make it more practical. Women want to be seen and heard. Mm-hmm. Men want to feel useful. Yeah. So in something that I've done in the past, they gave a good example. Um, and this goes into how do we talk about each other? Women have strong, independent women can do everything a guy could do. Mm-hmm. There's one thing a woman cannot do. And it's been genetically tested you will never be stronger than a man of equal stature it's just mm. your genes and the muscle makeup is not. but everything else i mean in my eyes women are stronger than men you think i could give birth hell no no we are not strong we cannot do it that <laughs> you're way you're all babies so saying that men are the stronger <laughs> sex only if it comes to moving a boulder yeah but besides that if we didn't have women this we wouldn't exist yeah trust me but um the, the example is Instead of a woman, yes, you can fix the light. You can fix the light. You start emasculating your man. Instead of saying, hey, can you change the light, change the light, change the light, and then he doesn't hear you, and then you get frustrated, it goes back and forth, Mm -hmm. simply go by the light bulb. Hey, honey, here's the light bulb. Can you fix that? And it's like, (laughs) oh, it's here? Yeah, sure, I got it. Boom. (laughs) Both of you hear each other. I feel useful. You sh- literally said, here's how you do it. Because the thing we think is like, oh, when am I going to go to Home Depot? You know, whatever, if, from the office, from the studio. I mean, I'm going to go and get the light bulb. And, <laughs> and then you could just get it. Here's the light bulb, fix it. Yeah, well, it's kind and of the I same rule right. of like, don't give a man too many options. It's like, you can't give him, honey, do you like this, 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 or this? They're like, ah, I don't know anything. You got to give a man like your, like if you have 10 options, you narrow it down to like two or three, and mm-hmm. then you give your man that. Honey, there's two or three options. Which do you like? Meanwhile, those are all the ones that you already have chosen to like. So, you know, it's a win-win for everyone. But I do think that's a sense of women communicate so differently, especially Mm -hmm. with each other. The things that we think, how we think, how we move, how we do things is completely the opposite of how men would logically think of something or do something. So our communication is always going to be like, well, how do we make this work? But I think it's like a slight like manipulation in that sense where your wife's like, honey here's the light bulb. Look, all you got to do is put it up. And you're like, I'm the man. I've just helped my wife with something, yeah. you know? And I, I mean, I hate to call it manipulation, but it's sort of like you're helping each other, help each other, you know? And like when you, I think when women are trying to tell men, well, I want him to surprise me. I want him to like do something and I want him to pick a place. It's like, he doesn't know. He's going to pick some stupid place that you don't want when you already know what you sort of want. 
you know, just be like, I would love to have the most delicious pasta tonight. And then let them figure out which pasta place to take you to. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think it comes down to make it easy for each other. Like my wife and I talk about communication all the time. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm telling you how to communicate. I'm like, you're telling me how, but instead of that, let's actually communicate to each other how not tell how so there's a difference let me lead you down this path mm -hmm. you lead me down a path let's try to meet in the middle and figure it out yeah I, and if we do that you end up with it because you just said oh surprise me you're like let's go here i hate that place but yeah. you used to love it but i hate it it's been 10 years I'm like oh i didn't know that but uh we're not easy creatures i have to say we're we're all sorts of complicated we change our mind all the time and you guys have it have it tough. That's but why I'm on my toes all the time. <laughs> that's smart, but that's the thing. That's what keeps you on your toes. Because imagine if it was the opposite. Be You'd boring. be bored to tears. Oh, yeah, I'd be bored. You know, and that's not any fun for anyone. So I think what's funny is you sort of need to learn each other's languages in a sense. You know, I think with every relationship I have, I'm like, okay, this is what works for him. And this is what doesn't work for him. But that takes a couple of weeks, months, maybe. And then you run with it. You can't just expect them to do something that you're like, I want him to figure mm -hmm. it out. It's like, he's not. Just spell it out and then he'll do it. You know, and men are much more simple than <laughs> women are. And I think women know that. So they need to stop pretending like he's got it all in this head, this master plan. He just needs to be given I the agree. instructions. <laughs> but there's a kicker. We change and evolve. And what was yesterday is not what is tomorrow. Yeah, well, that's a good thing. As long as you evolve as a couple, you know, and not apart. And that's when you're a winning team. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>